Father, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for just being you. And what that means for us is that you're our everything. Father, I am grateful right now that we have a seat at the king's table. We have been invited to come and always eat. And I, and I know that today and this week is centered around eating and, and sharing, Father, food with one another. It, it's centered on feasting of, of earthly goods. But may we, may we always be reminded and know that, that we don't deserve the invite that you have given to us. But it's because of grace and it's because of your love and your kindness for us that we get to come and sit at your table. And may that be our posture today. So as always, Father, we open up your recorded word. We pray that it meets us where we are. If it's encouragement this morning to, to treat others the way David treated somebody, then I pray that it spurs us on, Father. If it's teaching or correcting behavior, Father, we pray that Your Word does that very thing. And again, we thank You. Thank You for being who You are. Thank You for being consistent. Thank You, God. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9, I do believe it is. Yeah, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to get there in just a minute. Uh, I, I want to kind of give you a little bit of a background so that we understand our passage today, because if you're, if you're like me, this is one of those passages, like I've heard this somewhere along the way, but I don't hear this enough to be, to be completely familiar with all the details. And so let me just give you a quick little recap of what's taken place in David's life so far. All right, so you have the books, First and Second Samuel. First, the, the book of First Samuel has 31 chapters. It begins with the story of Samuel becoming a prophet, and, and then it moves to Israel gaining its first earthly king in Saul. So we've kind of talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, Samuel came on the scene. He was raised in the house of the Lord. He, be, he goes on to become a prophet. Israel wants a king. Saul's the guy that, that, that is chosen, right? So we talked about that. Then Saul kind of has some stuff going on in his life, and he's, he's not very repentant of anything. And, and God said, this isn't even my guy. I've got a guy. Samuel, go over to the house of Jesse, and, and, and I want you to anoint one of his sons to, to be my chosen king. Now, that's not an immediate thing. It's actually going to happen in, in 15 plus years. So, so we talked about that some. David and Goliath, we talked about that last week. You're familiar with, with that story. And, and the rest of 1 Samuel, okay, after David and Goliath do their thing, the, the rest of 1 Samuel is the struggle between Saul's jealousy of David and, and, and God literally just saying to Saul, my spirit is leaving you. And Saul is incredibly jealous. And he spends his time not only fighting off foreign enemies, but he is hunting David down. At one point in time, David is in the, the, the palace, if you will. He's in Saul's house. He, he, is, he, he is playing the harp or the lyre. I can't remember which one. And, 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 and Saul literally is chunking spears at him, trying to pin him against the wall, right? And, and I mean, like, you're talking about a, a traveling musician here. I mean, I mean, he's running up and down. He fears for his life. That is pretty much what's happening the rest of 1 Samuel. And you get to first, you get to chapter 31 of 1 Samuel. Saul and all but one of his sons die in battle. Like they've been surrounded. It's going down. Saul tells you know, his armor bearer who's there with him, hey, kill me. Run, run the sword through me so that they can't torture me. 
And the armor bearer is like, I'm not doing that. And so Saul takes his own life. He kills himself and then the rest of his sons, all but one who's not there, they die in that moment. 2 Samuel chapter 1 opens up. David is in another place and he finds out that Saul and son Jonathan he finds out that they have died in battle. And he mourns, he laments their loss. Also in 2 Samuel chapter 1, David is anointed king of Judah. And, and, and he moves to Hebron to live and to establish his kingdom. Now Saul still had one son who did not die in battle. Okay? And, and, and I want you to know, to, to, to proceed with this, you got to know, every Sunday when I come up here, I have a couple of fears. You need to know that every Sunday. And I've shared these fears with you before. I, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to trip and just wipe out up here. Okay? And I don't, I don't want y'all to have any more, you know, ammo to laugh at me and that kind of stuff. It's recorded. I don't need that. So that's a fear. Um, I got a fear that my zipper's going to be down. Oh, you know, I'm like, <laughs> that, that doesn't need to happen either. Okay? I, I have a fear that I will, on a serious note, misinterpret. And I don't want any part of misinterpreting God's word. But then I also have this fear that I'll cuss. Okay? <laughs> like, I don't want that to come out. Okay? <laughs> And today, there's a name, and it happens to be Saul's son. Okay? It's the one who's living. And, and his name, and I've got this fancy, you know, Bible software that I just type the words in, and it pronounces this stuff for me. And so I rehearse these words, believe it or not. I really do. And as I'm rehearsing this last night, um, this was after the Auburn game, which you know probably made me want to cuss a little bit. Amanda is listening to this automated thing pronounce this name, and she looks at me and says, "Don't even attempt that tomorrow. <laughs> like, don't, don't even. Like, even if you nail it, it still sounds like a word. Okay, and you have no. Just don't. Don't even try to do that. Okay. So, so I tell you that because she's 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 warning, and she's gonna like she's going to know. I mean, she's going to ask. And so we're just going to call him Ish. Okay, I-S-H. That's, that's, that, that's the first part of his name, actually. And, and with the last, second part, you know, you, you can, I'm telling you, it, it's, whoo, it's, it's, it's dicey. So, Ish. That is Saul's son, the one who did not die in battle. And in chapter 2, 2 Samuel, Ish is made king of Israel. Remember a couple weeks ago when I stood up here and I told you that David was actually the third king of Israel. Some of you are like, huh? What? Michael doesn't know his Bible and stuff. Well, now you know why. Because Ish was actually made king. One of the military leaders thought that, hey, this is Saul's kingdom. Who cares what God wants? And we're going to take, you know, the one heir that is left of Saul and we're going to make him king because he's the military commander. And so... You know, that's, that's what happened. Now, here's the issue with that. We know this is the issue. David is the anointed king chosen by God to be the king over Israel and Judah. And this isn't coming up on the screen, but, but listen, listen to what 2 Samuel 3 says. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and and weaker. And so, so, so even after Saul's gone, even after Jonathan, his good friend, is gone, the, this, this Ish son has been appointed king of Israel. They're still feuding between David's family and Saul's family. And that goes on, and it doesn't tell us exactly how long it goes on. It just says that it goes on for a long time. These two are feuding. And if you really want some fascinating stuff to read, you, you need to go read chapters you know, uh, the first part of 2 Samuel, 1 through, well, all of it's really good for you, but, but through especially what we're talking about today. I, I mean, at one point in time, uh, you got David's guys, there's 12 of them, and, 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 and Isha's guys, he's got 12 of them, and they're just like, hey, let's just go mano a mano one on one. And they sit there and they, they just fight each other. And, and this dude by the name of Abner 
is, is like he sees that they're losing. So he takes off running. One of David's guys takes off after him. Abner kills this guy by just taking the butt of his spear, not the sharp pointy end, okay? The blunt end and just rams it right through him, right? Like it goes in the front, out the back, and you're like, wow. Like, I mean, that's it. So those are the kind of stories that you would read. So, you know, quit watching whatever it is on TV and read the Bible. You'll, you'll be entertained, okay? It's really good stuff there. In chapter four, ish, this is another thing, right? Ish is laying in his house, napping and avoiding the noonday heat. And two men have their own little motivation. They sneak into his house, they stab him, and they cut off his head so that they can take it to David to let David know that he can now take over and be the king of Israel and Judah as God intended. And so as this unfolds, they literally bring the head of Ish to David. And David, the man that he is, why did you do such a thing? Why did you take an innocent man's life? Is he deserving of it? No, he's not deserving to be the king, but God's going to work things out in his time. I will become king when it's necessary. And so what does David do? He kills those two dudes. <laughs> Four, five, and six. There's a lot of stuff that takes place. We're now at chapter nine. So let's read it. Second Samuel 9, verses 1 through 12 or 13. David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, are, are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Take note of that, God's kindness. Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. We actually meet him in the earlier chapters. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Makar, son of Amamiel in Lodeber. So King David had him brought from Lodeber, from the house of Makar, son of Amamiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. I should shorten this dude's name. Don't be afraid, verse 7. David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a son named Mika and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Chapters 5 through 8 of 2 Samuel have David fighting a whole bunch of enemies, conquering them all. He goes and he goes on a mission to bring the ark back. He brings the ark back and he establishes his house to live in in Jerusalem. 
This is where he starts this idea of, hey, I've got, God's given me a house of cedar to live in. I, I need to make him a house. And, and that's where Nathan comes in and says, whoa, 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 you've done a lot of good, uh, but that's, that's not your call. God will got to let you know when it's time for him to have a house. And so chapters 5 through 8, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's happening there. And as David is getting settled into bringing unity to God's people, Israel and Judah, he asks the question, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I mean, there's a lot going on in the, in the man's life. He, he's got his stuff set up. He, he's starting to establish his presence in Jerusalem as king over Israel and Judah together. And, and what's the thing that's on his mind? Is there anybody left from Jonathan's household that I can show kindness to? Now, I, I can't go back and, and give the entire history lesson today, but David loved Saul's son, Jonathan. And, and if you think about it, We've used them as an example. They are one of the biblical pictures of earthly relationships that, that we should model. 1 Samuel chapter 20, I'll read these couple of verses for you. I think it's coming up here. 1 Samuel 20 verse 14, But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan had, had, and Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Now what's standing in the way in this is Jonathan's own father. And, and, and that's what this covenant is about because David's like, Jonathan, you're missing it, man. He wants to kill me. And Jonathan's like, no, no, he said he's over you now. And, and David's like, no, 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 no. And so they're going back and forth. And that's where this covenant is made because he loved him as he loved himself. David loved Jonathan. And even though now Jonathan is dead, David is still that David is still wanting to use his position as king to bless those who were related to Jonathan. Right? David doesn't even, you know, David doesn't even know if there is someone still alive. It's not like Jonathan's over there, hey, look, newborn son, Instagram, it's out there on the web. You're right. I mean, that, that wasn't around. There, there wasn't. David's like, I don't even know if he's got people anymore. But if he does, I want to bless him. I, I, I want to, I want to meet their needs out of the love that he had for Jonathan, his friend. I mean, I know families take care of families, right? We got generational love that we have one for another. Do you, do you have anybody in your life, church, that loves you so much that they want to bless your family? In, in, in your passing, and in, in you, when you're not around, when you're not here, is, is, there, is there somebody in your life that loves you so much that they want to step in and be a blessing to you? Because, because that, that's what it's about. He loved him as he loved himself. So he calls in one of Saul's house managers, the guy that kind of handles Saul's estate. Ziba is his name. He inquires of him. Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Uh-oh, we've elevated. Now, we went from kindness to now God's kindness. And so David, so Ziba tells David about Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, who just happens to be Jonathan's son. Now, remember, remember, this because you, you, you know this. You've you watched enough TV to know that this, this, this is playing on. The house of David and the house of Saul were at war for a very long time. 
And historically, in monarchies, when one family takes over the throne from another family, the now ruling family wants to rid any threats from the existing ruling family. Right? And, and, and so, so you've got to know that this is, this is in the background of this thing. And, and you've got Zeba over here. And now like he's Saul's manager. And he kind of comes in. He's a little proud. He's a little haughty right there. He comes in. He's not bowing low. He's just at your service what you need. Okay? And, and, and so that angle is, is part of this. But it's not so with David. Because David is this man after God's own heart. And we're going to dive into that for the next couple of weeks just so you know. We're going to dive into what that looks like, good, bad, and very ugly, in the life of David, as to what it is to be this man after God's heart. And so Mephibosheth shows up. He bows low before the king. I'm at your service. Now, he's lame. He's, he's pretty much bedridden. I mean, his feet don't work. He's living with a relative. And in verse 7, this is what David says, don't be afraid. David said to him, for, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Now, this is the second time in this chapter the word kindness has been used. Church, you need to know this word. Kindness as it's being used here in both instances as it's being used in the conversation between David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel. This, this, this kindness is not, oh, I'm going to let you go first today so that you get food and you, I'll let you have the last deviled egg. Okay? I never get deviled eggs with these things because all you greedy people are never kind to me. <laughs> kindness is not just this this. Let me do something nice for you. That's certainly our understanding of kindness, but not this Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is hased. You've heard me talk about this one other time. In short, hased is closely associated with agapo, agape. This unconditional, sacrificial love. We, we, we can wrap our minds around, even though we struggle to fully live this out, we can kind of wrap our minds around what, what agape is, what, what, what this unconditional, what this sacrificial love is. We can, we can kind of wrap our minds around that. Um, uh, hased, it, it's, it's much broader, and, and it's much deeper. Uh, Jim Wilder is a neuroscientist who also happens to have a, a couple of uh, theology degrees. All right, he calls himself a, a neurotheologian. Okay? He says this about hased. This Hebrew word carries the sense of an enduring connection that brings life and all good things into a relationship. Hased is a kind and loyal care for the well-being of another. The kind and loyal care for the well-being of another. An another biblical definition of hased is the expression of God's love towards his children. Now, not like my child, the teenager, who has attitude. Not, not, not like, and because and, 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 we've been there. Like, like, we, we've all we've all dealt with the, the those people and the hormones and all the stuff that's happening. And you were one, just FYI, to your parents. The expression of God's love towards his children. Think of the first time you look at that, that, that newly born child as a parent. I mean, at that moment in time, something shifts internally for you as a parent. And I, and I know I've shared this story. Like, like the very first time I held Griffin, right? Like, like he's, he's there and he's slimy and he's kind of red. And, and he's actually still attached. And, and, and I was so excited. I tried to literally take him out of the room. Umbilical cord still attached. Like, I'm not even making that up. Of course, there's the eye thing, too. Y'all remember the eyes. I hear about that all the time. Hey, like, look. I got a genius. His eyes are already open. That's what I knew about kids. You think about that moment. At least in healthy relationships, right? And, and, and in healthy environments. If something happens, you, you move from... From life is about me 
to life is now about someone else. And when you look at that newborn child, you smell that newborn child, man, there, there's, there's a joy there. there, there there's a feeling there that, that you don't get anywhere else. The expression of God's love towards His children. That is the set. That is exactly how God looks at you and I every day. Not, oh, we messed up again. Oh, look at there, living in sin one more time. I can't get out of his own way. Oh, he's got attitude. Oh, he's ignoring me. Yeah, God doesn't want those things. But that's not how he looks at you. That's not how he sees you. He sees you with this, this expression of joy. And that is the invite to Mephibosheth. I will show you kindness. And then you take the story. You take what happens in verse 7. This is intertwined very much so with grace. Verse 7 mentions Hesed. It mentions God's kindness. But verse 7 is a picture of grace. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. Church, Mephibosheth did nothing to deserve this invite. Nothing. He, he's sitting at, 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 at some relative's house being taken care of. David doesn't even know that he existed. You ever feel that way sometimes? Man, you, you, you ever feel that in this world man, that, that, that no one knows that you exist? Mephibosheth is living his life. He can't even take care of himself. And out of Hesed, David invites Mephibosheth into his home. He restores all the land that was Saul's and, and Saul's family, and he gives him a place at his table. Church, that's the very thing that Jesus did for us. Our men are going to come forward and they're going to, they're going to pass out these emblems. And, and, and today, I know we do it different ways every Sunday, but today we're going to, I'm going to ask that you, you, just, you take and you hold these together and we're going to take them as a family sitting at the king's table. We are invited to the king's table. That, that's, that's, that's what this is. Jesus was sitting around with his closest followers. And he said, every time that you gather in my name, every time that, that you are gathered with other believers, pause. Remember this moment. Remember what's being done. Through the kindness of Jesus, through Hesed, because of grace, He invites you and I to feast at His table. And do not miss the word always. All Mephibosheth has to do is, is get, he's, he's, he's got to come up to the table. He has a personal invite to be there for every single meal. And, and it's not just some cut rate leftovers. It's not just the crumbs that fall to the floor. You get to come and you get to eat the finest, the choicest of everything that this kingdom has to offer. That is what you've been invited into. And church, that is the very 
promise. That's the very invite to you from Jesus. When he said, come and follow me. Come and follow me. I'm going to give you the very finest as you live on this earth, as you learn to be like me. And then what awaits you, you, you can't even imagine. The Fibbishef bowed down in verse 8 and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's, that's not flattering for, for dog lovers, okay? This, this is very negative. And once again, the Fibbishef bows down. He's literally floored by David's kindness. Who or what am I that you should even notice me? Church, God notices you. He does not claim the privileges that David extends to him as a right. I deserve these. He does not do that. No, he receives it as pure grace, unearned and completely undeserved. And so as we take these emblems this morning, as you hold the representing the, what represents Jesus' body and what represents Jesus' blood, the body that was broken, the blood that washes away our sins, we are undeserving of being allowed at the King's table. But because of God's kindness, we're all invited. So as you hold the bread and the holy the juice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for the grace that has been extended. The invite to come and sit at the king's table. We are grateful for your love this morning, Father. God, it is my prayer this morning that all of us know that we don't deserve it. But through your love, through your desire for you, through the hesed that you have for us, here we are. We are grateful. Thank you for the miracle of the cross and what Jesus did for us. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, Take me. And then he took the wine. This represents my blood, it washes away sin. Take and drink.